of need. Father, I pray that this afternoon you will anoint everyone seated in your presence with the fresh oil of your grace and favor. And I ask for grace and strength that in clarity with precision and accuracy, I will share your word with your people in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people shall say, Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. I'm reading two verses. Praise the Lord. Matthew 9. Oh, it's good to see you, Jeff. Welcome. Good. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor it's a good day. Say like you mean it. Wow. Matthew 9, verses 14 and 15. Let's hear the word of God. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Amen. Amen. This morning I'm sharing, uh, this afternoon I'm sharing with us on the subject imitating the fasting life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. The truth is that people who have experienced the presence of the Lord in a powerful way have been those who have discovered the secret of praying and fasting. The truth about life is that there is a time for everything. And there is a time to eat and there is a time to fast. And I want to encourage you that if the need to fast comes, may we kindly put away the chicken and the uh, and the egushi soup and the, and the kelewales and the plantains and the Yorkshire puddings for some time. You see, beloved, understand that the warfare is so real, but the good news is that so also is the abundant grace of our Lord and our God. Fasting will always, and it's a deliberate abstinence from some or all food for a spiritual purpose. Of course, there are those also who fast, simply because of physical needs. But we are looking at the subject of fasting from the biblical point of view. Fasting demands a deep level of commitment. As a child of God, if your spiritual hunger becomes so deep, if you begin to hunger genuinely for God, if your determination in intercession becomes so intense, after looking around you, you discover that God is calling you to intercede for the decay of your generation. Also, if your spiritual warfare becomes so demanding, then you will have no other choice than to temporarily set aside every fleshly desire to give yourself to prayer, and to fasting. The truth about Jesus is that he began his public ministry with a 40 days fast and prayer in the wilderness and was immediately tempted by the devil when he had finished. And the Bible declares that after that fast and that temptation, he returned into ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is power in fasting. May the Lord give it to you in the name of Jesus. If Jesus began his ministry with praying and fasting, 
and is encouraging you and I to do so, then we have no excuse. Jesus himself emphasized that there are some battles which will never, which you will never be able to overcome except through praying and fasting. And in the passage that I read, the disciples of John come to him and they identify themselves as Pharisees. And they are saying to Jesus, we fast often, but how come your disciples do not fast? Then Jesus gives them a very interesting answer. He says, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast. You see, Jesus expected us to fast after he was gone. As the church awaits his return, we are commissioned and Jesus commands us that not only should we occupy till he comes, but we occupy till he comes by doing the works of the Lord. And we can never do the works of the Lord if we do not intensely give ourselves to praying and to fasting. Is somebody with me today? Yes, sir. Understand that as a people of God, Looking at the generation that we live in, a generation that has become so perverted. We fast as a people of God as a sign of our sorrow for the sin and for the decay of our world. Is somebody with me today? We fast that righteousness will return. We also fast in preparation for the soon coming of our God and King. You see, I have never ever seen a wedding that was conducted and immediately after the wedding, the bride, the groom, the bride, the groom, and then the maid of honors and all the page boys and all the bridal party went somewhere to begin to fast. After a wedding, what happens is feasting. And Jesus is saying, as my going back to my father has become eminent, if there is any time for the church to rejoice and enjoy my presence, it is now. But a time is coming when I will be taken away from them. Then the church will have every cause to begin to pray and to fast. And you and I know that Jesus has been away 2,000 years ago. But the good news is that he is coming back. He is coming back in power. He is coming back in glory. He is coming back in majesty for his bride, which is the church. But now that the bridegroom is not with us, the bride, which is the church, has no other choice than to be fasting and to be praying. Fasting and praying causes one to become much more spiritually sensitive to the Lord. The essence of fasting is that when you fast, when you dedicate yourself to fast, you become spiritually sensitive to the things of God. Because all earthly and fleshly desires are put away and your mind is on the Lord only. And the truth about fasting is that it changes you and not God. It moves the hand of God, but when you fast, you begin to experience the changes of the Holy Spirit, changes that the Holy Spirit will bring into your life. The truth about prayer is also, uh, about fasting is that it helps our prayer to become more focused. The Bible records three types of fasting. The first is a normal fast, and that is abstaining from all food, solid or liquid, but not from water. When you are fasting, the normal fast, it is not wrong to drink water. Then there is the absolute fast. The absolute fast is abstaining from food and water totally. And normally, this is done for three days. When you don't take in any food, you don't take in any water. And in the scriptures, only three people undertook the absolute fast. That is Jesus himself, Moses, and Elijah. 
And, and, and Moses, after the 40 day fast, when he got down from the temple uh, from Mount Sinai, the Bible declares that he, his face began to shine with the glory of the Lord. There is power in fasting. And listen, with the 40 day fast, if, if you do not hear God speak to you, don't undertake that fast. Tell your neighbor, are you hearing, Pastor? Because I personally know two people who tried it and died. You don't abstain from food and water for 40 days if God has not asked you to do that. Amen. The true story of three friends who decided to go on a 40-day fast. From the Garden City, they drove all the way down to the Western region in a small town on the West African interior coast by name Takwa. Then when they got there, they locked the doors and, and gave their uh, mobile phones to the driver to take away back to the city and told the driver to come back after 40 days because they were ready to change their city for Christ. What? If God speaks, man, that is powerful. So the first day, no, no water, no food. They prayed, praying their hearts out. Second day, no water, no food. Praying their hearts out. Third day, hey. No water, no food. Praying their hearts. Then on the fourth day, ha, the guys began to realize. <laughs> they were not sure whether they heard from the Lord. And as their legs began to shake and their body began to shake, demand, and they had taken literally every water and every food out of the room. And they had locked themselves. They were determined. Then when the elders discovered that the way things were going, it was becoming dangerous, he started speaking in tongues. Mokata ba ha! That say the Lord. I have answered all your prayers and you can go home. You see, who are you deceiving? And as a child of God, never undertake the 40 day fast except you hear God asking you to do so. I know some men of God who do it consistently. At the beginning of every year, the first 40 days, they seclude themselves from society and they fast and they pray without taking in any water, without taking in any food. God asks them to do that. And so they do that. Hallelujah. Then there is a partial fast. The partial fast found in Daniel 10, 3 is abstaining from some fruits. You know, you can go on a fast and all what you eat are fruits. You can go on a fast and you can abstain from any form of solid food and you can eat, let's say, only cereals. You can go on that partial fast and then uh, all what you take in in the day is maybe just a meal in the morning and that is it. So there are three forms of fasting and as a child of God, you must ensure that you partake of at least two of these fastings in the name of Jesus. Understand that anywhere you find prayer and fasting, you will find victory in the midst of difficulties. The miraculous invades the impossible and there is always a supernatural intervention diverting demonic intentions away in the name of Jesus. It will take prayer and fasting to remove altars that speak against you in the name of Jesus. The question then is why do we fast? What are the benefits of fasting? Jesus will never ask you and I to do what will not benefit us. The first benefit of prayer, of fasting, is that it demonstrates our obedience to God's word. In life, beloved, understand that obedience determines your blessing. The Lord himself says that it is better to obey than to sacrifice and to hearken 
than the fat of rams. In Joel chapter 2 verse 12, the Bible says, Now therefore says the Lord, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So God himself calls us and asks us to turn to him with all our heart. And how do we turn to him with all our heart? With fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And Jesus says again that when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites who put up a sad countenance. So even when we are fast, you see, Jesus expected us to fast. Therefore, he says, when you fast. And he says, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites telling everybody, I'm on a fast today. I'm on a two-day fast today. I'm on a... The moment you do that, you have received the praise of men and you receive nothing from God. Praise the Lord. And understand that there are some challenges in this life. It will only take fasting and prayer to cast them away. So we fast to obey God by saying that, yes, Lord, I will be obedient to your word. Because you are the Lord who knows what is best for me. Therefore, in obedience, I will go on the fast. But secondly, fasting also helps us to mourn over personal sin and then also to plead for mercy. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba and killed the husband of Uriah to conceal his sin, God confronted him through the prophet Nathan. You see, David looked at the Ten Commandments and committed two of them. So seriously, the Ten Commandments says, thou shall not commit adultery. David committed adultery. The Ten Commandments says, thou shall not kill. David killed. And you see, God who sees, not as man sees, but sees what is on the heart and knoweth all things and sees all things, sends Nathan to David in the confines and comfort of his palace. So Nathan goes and says, O king, in a city there was a man. In our city here yeah, there was a man who was so rich and had a head of sheep. So rich, head of sheep, cattle, everything. Then there was another poor man who had only one lamb. And that lamb to him was like a wife. He slept with that uh, lamb on his bread, sat at table with that Lamp, that lamp was so precious to him. Then this rich man had a visitor. And when the visitor came because of his power and influence, he sent for the ear lamp, the only lamp that this poor man had. And they killed it to prepare a feast and a meal for it. The moment he said that, David said, as long as the Lord lives, such a man should not live. Nathan looked at his face and said, you are the man. You see, understand that David was powerful. He was a king. He had authority. He had the armies of Israel behind him. And remember, it was God who had put him on the throne. And when he was confronted with his sin, he could have found excuses by saying, oh, look, I, I, I was just taking a stroll on top of my house and this woman knew very well that he, she lives next to me, went on the bathroom and began to bathe. David could have found any form of excuse. But he remembered that he had broken the commandments of the Lord by killing to conceal his sin of adultery. David goes on his knees and says, I have sinned against the Lord. And then began to pray one of the most powerful prayers in the scripture, Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David understood that the mercies of God are tender. You know, what, what, you see, God's, God is not a wicked God. His heart is tender because God sees us and he sees us as dust. He sees us as weaklings. He, he, he knows our frame. He made us. And as such, if we plead his mercy, God will always intervene. Unlike Saul, who confronted Samuel by 
passing the bad and the excuses on to others by saying that it was because of the people. You see, anytime you make a mistake and pass the, uh, the, your excuse on to other people, it means you are not repentant, you are not remorseful, you are not prepared to change. It means you don't fear God one minute. But the moment, you see, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, the Bible makes it quite clear, 1 John 1, 8, if we say we are without sin, then we are liars. The truth is that God knows that as a people in this fallen world, we will make mistakes. Therefore, he says, 1 John 1, 9, that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. David knew that he had made a mistake. So he went on his knees and in the second verse he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And in the 17th verse he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contract heart. This, O oh God, you will not despise. David understood that the moment he comes before God with a broken heart. It, you see, the key is brokenness. Not until we are broken of our weaklings and the mistakes that we do and mourn over them. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And anybody who, you see, at times the thoughts that the devil pushes through your mind alone is enough for you to go on your knees and to ask God for cleansing. And there are two major sins, sins of commission. Those are the sins that we deliberately do. Then there are sins of omission. Things that we should do that we fail to do. And one major form of that sin is failing to share the gospel with somebody else. And at times, unknowingly, the way you spoke in a meeting can cause somebody to take offense. At times, the way you laughed. The, 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 the way you explained yourself, somebody just sits somewhere and takes anger for nothing. Because of you, because of the, at times, just because of the way you eat. And, and the truth is that, <laughs> I've experienced that before. I remember one time, I had visited a place and uh, we were meant to go to the restaurant to eat. And somebody said, as long as this man is there, I'm not going to the restaurant. I said, what? He said, the way he... <laughs> so literally, he has taken offense. <laughs> but the way the man eats. Therefore, it is important as a child of God that we all understand that we are not perfect. And one of the things that fasting helps us to do is that when we see those sins recurring, we go on a fast and we go before God and we plead with him for mercy because he's a merciful and a compassionate God in the name of Jesus. But number three, we also fast to obtain strength from God. As you fast and plead with God for help and strength, God gives it to you. As you fast, may the Lord grant you strength. May the Lord give you help. As you fast, you see, the moment you begin to go on a fast, all what you are saying is that my help cometh from the Lord. Because when you fast, you are fasting unto the Lord. You are not fasting. You, you are not going on a fast to please anybody. You are going on the fast because you are in a critical situation and you need strength from God. And when you do that, you deliver yourself from the hands of some very dangerous people. And some dangerous churches. I, I, I was browsing the net. You know, one of the things I love to do is to browse the net, especially when I'm preparing a sermon, to, to look out for something, illustrations that relate to my sermon. And it just dropped in my heart to look out for the various kinds of churches that enables people to deceive innocent people in the world. And I was shocked the names that I found. The first church I found was called Guided Missile Church. <laughs> I, I would say Guided Missile Church. So what they are saying in that church, they are, they are like a Tomahawk missile. That, that is short from, from a cruise of the United States of America. They are praying, <laughs> mercy Lord. 
Then the other one I found was Jehovah Shab Shab Church. <laughs> hey! Jehovah Shab Shab Church. So it means that for us, when you come here, everything is Shab Shab. Listen, God makes all things beautiful in his own time. And there is a time to fast. There is a time to fast simply because you need strength from God. You need help. Your help cometh only from him. And the other one was called Hurricane Miracle Ministry. So in other words, Hurricane. So all what they are mercy. The Lord is merciful. So for them, they will cause Hurricane in the camp of your enemies. Hurricane Miracle Ministry. Another one was called Laboratory Church of God. Their church is a laboratory. So, uh, and uh, what, what, what do we do in the laboratory? In a, in a lab <laughs> Tell your neighbor, mercy. Then, another one was called Cash from Christ Church. Cash from Christ Church. But the one that I found shocking was the, no, before that, before. Another was seven thunders of Jesus' ministry. Seven thunders. Jesus will thunder. But the one I found most shocking and very interesting was, go tell Ahab Elijah that Elijah is here, church. <laughs> I said, but this way you could have written a song and said, go tell my enemies I am under the rock. Jehovah. Ah. Go tell Ahab that Elijah is here, church. But you see, when you go on a fast as a child of God, what you are saying to yourself is that your help cometh only from the Lord and that God is a faithful God and that help will come in the name of Jesus. May your help come only from God. Hallelujah. Put your trust in him because he is a faithful God. Quickly turn with me to Psalm 109. Let's look at some verses. We pray to receive strength and help from God. In Psalm 109, David begins by saying, Do not keep silent, O God of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. And the truth is that whichever way you look at, look at it, there are people who just love to lie about you. Verse 3, they have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. And understand that there are some people, they will fight against you, not because you have done anything wrong, but just because of the glory of God that is over your life. And David begins this prayer in a very somber manner, pleading and uh, making his case known before the Lord his God. Let me read the verse 3 again. He says, they have also surrounded me with words of hatred. And fought against me without a cause. And there are people, the only reason they are talking about you is simply because they hate you. And the worst at times, listen, don't believe anything that you hear about other people. I'm telling you. Verse 4. In return for my love, they are my accusers. But I give myself to prayer. Oh, well done, David. But I give in the midst of the love, the good I have done to them, now they have become my accusers. But Lord, I won't say anything. I'm giving myself to prayer. Then David begins to pray. Oh, David. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Then in the sixth verse, he says he's giving himself to prayer. Then he, now he begins to pray. Set a wicked man over him. And let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty. That means this man will never win any court case. And set a wicked man over him and let an accuser, when an accuser stand at his right hand, it means anywhere you go, people will be accusing you. 
They just look at your face and they begin to say all manner of things. And this was a prayer. Verse 7. When he is judged, let him be found guilty. And let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few. And let another take his office. Oh, David. You said you are giving yourself to prayer. And you know what? He's telling God not to keep silent. Because of what people were doing to him. Then he says, verse 8, let his days be few and let another take his office. Hey, David. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Then David comes back to his senses and then look at verse 21. But you, O God, the Lord, Deal with me for your name's sake. Because your mercy is good, deliver me. Because your mercy is good, deliver me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. You see, David was very, very honest with God. All what David is saying here is that, oh Lord, I'm hurt. I, 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 I feel the pain. You know, at times... Out you go the extra mile to do good to people. And they throw it at your face. And they stamp on it. And then the, the, the worst of it, they go around and begin to say all manner of things about you. Somebody you helped. Removing that person from poverty. Now the person knows how to change the Jubilee line and the Metropolitan line and, and the Victoria line and the Northern line. And now they are saying all manner of things about you. Even when that happens, you must become a man of prayer and don't curse. Amen. Amen. He says, my heart is wounded within me. I don't know about you, but if your heart is wounded within you today, may the Lord grant you help in the name of Jesus. May the Lord grant you strength in the name of Jesus. Beloved, don't let the past poison your future. Understand that find every cause to forgive and don't let that pain overwhelm your life so much so that you are blinded from seeing the future of God ahead of you and you allow that pain to become so much. But David was honest. He says, Lord, I am wounded. I am wounded. Has somebody wounded you? And you know that words can wound lies can wound false accusation can wound but when that happens go on a fast because if you are not careful to receive to ask God for that strength you become so bitter and God will never honor bitterness because he honors only obedience and he says forgive even as your father forgave you forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So, as a child of God, as much as you'll be wounded, you have no cause whatsoever to hold on to that pain. And Jesus God gave God a reason to forgive you and I. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And you must always find a cause to forgive people. And the cause to forgive people is that it's a command from God. And also because you want to travel far. You see, a relationship in which you invested so much, the, the, the man just took it and threw it at your face. A marriage in which sisters and extended people will not allow you to marry. You invested so much. Forgive. Because it will help you to live long. I have decided in life to travel far. So I have made up my mind to travel light. These days, British Airways, an SS bag, is 140 pounds. I am not going to carry anybody's SS baggage. L listen. Listen. Unforgiveness is SS baggage. When you carry unforgiveness, you are the one who gets hurt. I'm telling you, that guy has, that guy is enjoying his, he's sitting somewhere called Gold Coast. <laughs> enjoying himself. And you are so hurt. And it's showing on you. It's telling on your face. You are growing like that guy is chilling somewhere. <laughs> Tell 
your neighbor, may the Lord grant you help. May the Lord grant you grace. You see, unforgiveness is like buying a Rolls Royce. And the truth is that as we sit here right now, we can buy one, but we don't have the money yet. Are you hearing me? I know some of you can easily buy that, but the truth is that you don't need it now. Unforgiveness is like buying a jet you don't need. Find a reason as a child of God always to forgive. And one of the surest ways of doing that is to ask God for strength and help to let it go. And David was honest. He, after praying all this wicked prayer, he discovered it won't work. So he says, Lord, the truth is that I'm wounded. I'm hurt. And I've literally seen people who became so hurt that they went mad. They went mad. I remember when I was a young boy growing up in the early 70s, a whole professor, he would come to our school always dressed with a bow tie, and he was a good pianist, and would come to our secondary school down in Dunkwa, just play, and, and, and oh, goodness me. Always with a, with a book with files under his, preparing his sermons to go and lecture. Because his best friend took his wife. And he couldn't overcome it. The thing became so painful to him that at the end he lost his mind. And at times he would just stand in the dining hall of a secondary school and he would start lecturing. And he would start pointing to people who are not there. Empty chairs. Why have you submitted your, your essay late? I will give you an F. The man was gone. And the friend was enjoying his wife. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's very painful and very serious. But all this time that the mind was gone, the friend was enjoying his wife. Tell somebody, I will let you go. Come on, say it again. Understand that we live in a world which is wicked. This is a perverted, crooked, and wicked generation. If you don't learn to walk in unforgiveness, huh, next week, by God's grace, I'll be 62 years. And I've made up my mind, Lord, let me live long. But take every bitterness out of my spirit in the name of Jesus. The Lord says, let no root of bitterness remain in you that it might rise up and defile others. You see, the truth about bitterness is that it defiles. And literally, if you don't deal with your bitterness, you translate it to other people. And there are people who are not talking to people, not because that, that person has done something to them, but because of what they've heard about them. So they don't talk to them. If you go to a place where you'll be hurt, be wise, but don't Cut yourself off, but walk in wisdom. Is somebody with me today? So David was honest and he says, Lord, my heart is wounded within me. Verse 23, I'm gone like a shadow when it lengthens. I am shaking off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting and my flesh is feeble from lack of fatness. David went on a very serious fast because the head was so mad. And he fasted so much that his knees began to, the knees no longer could support him. And at times, that is how far you must go, depending on the need that you want in the name of Jesus. And I want to stand here and declare in the name of Jesus that for some of us, as a church, there are many people here who have been hurt, wounded, not because they did anything wrong, but people offended them. And there are people here who have altars that have been erected and that is speaking against them. And there are people here who people have spoken into the atmosphere, have buried things about their lives that they are going nowhere. Those are altars. It will only take a corporate prayer and fasting to break those altars in the name of Jesus. And if you love me as your dad, I want to stand here and declare in the name of Jesus that from this Friday, 
every Friday, let each one of us fast. And let us come together as a family and, and pray till all these altars are removed in the name of Jesus. Till the heavens are open over us corporately as a church for God to begin to reign righteousness, to begin to reign favor, to begin to reign promotion, to begin to reign on common health. Are you here? And God willing, from this Friday, I'll be leading the prayer myself. And come, if you can fast only to 12 o'clock, fast to 12 o'clock. But listen, whatever time you go to bed, that is when your fasting starts. If you go to bed at 9 o'clock, your fast starts at 9. If you go to bed at 10, your fast starts at 10. Don't get up in the morning and go and pound And pound yam and, 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 and fufu and whatever. And eat it with a gushi soup and, and, and palm nut soup. Don't do that. And listen, if you went to bed at nine, that is when your fast starts. And if all what you can do is up to 12 noon, God looks at the heart, He knows your strength. It is enough. If it is up to two o'clock, God knows your heart, He knows you are starting. It is enough. If it is 4 p.m., God knows. It's, it's the heart. It's not the length. It's the time. It's the heart. And if you can do three days, why not? If it's up to 6 o'clock, God looks at your heart. If it's the whole Friday, God looks at your heart. But let us congregate here as a family and lift an anthem of worship and prayer unto the Lord till heaven breaks loose and begin to visit us as a church in the name of Jesus. I believe that we can stand in the gap and nobody in this church will die before their time. Yeah. When we make a quality decision to pray corporately, the heavens will be open. Yeah. With healing, the Lord will arise with healing in his wings yeah. over us in the name of Jesus. And may that start this Friday. Every Friday, let every TBC member go on a fast. Yeah. I'm not talking about the kind of fast where people get up and from 4, uh, 3 p.m. pound all kind of food and eat heavily and then break it at 6 o'clock. Not that kind of fast. If it's 9, that is when your fast start. Then you are breaking at 12, it is fine. Break it with something very light and come and let us pray together in the name of Jesus. Can I have a witness in the house? But we also fast to, oh my goodness, we also fast to overcome temptations in areas that limit the power of God in our lives. If I have to finish here, I'll finish here and continue another time. We fast to overcome temptations in areas that limit the power of God in our lives. Listen, every one of us, before we came to know Christ, there were areas in our lives where we had weaknesses. And the devil knows that. The devil will never tempt you in areas where you are strong. And there are three areas in which the devil will always tempt you. And, and the gospel writer Matthew makes it quite clear that after 40 days of praying and fasting, Jesus became hungry and the devil appeared to him and began to tempt him. Listen, when you begin to pray and to ask God for grace and, and, and to overcome the sin that so easily besets you, lies that people propound about will no longer have dominion over you. And young people, listen to me. That false uh, 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 pit of her lie that at 17, if you don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that your blood will freeze is a pit from hell. How, how, how can blood freeze? And there are people going around telling young people, if you don't have a boyfriend, your blood will freeze. Your blood will what? Your blood will become healthier in the name of Jesus. Amen. He is a liar. So in the wilderness, Jesus overcame all the major temptations for you and for me. The first temptation the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are, as if Jesus didn't know who he was. 
And Jesus made it quite clear to him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. What the devil was trying to do there was to tempt Jesus in the lust of his flesh. To let him do things out of the flesh. And the truth is that our strongest enemy is our flesh. We sleep with him. We rise up with him. When we are angry, we speak our mind. And at times, we do things simply because this flesh. But thank God for praying and fasting. You are able to break process. I bring my body under. I bring my flesh under. In other words, I subdue those desires so that after I have preached to others, I will not be a castaway. Glory to God. Then the devil comes again and tests Jesus with the pride of life. Sets him on the pinnacle of a mountain and says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written that he will give his angels charge over you and they will bear you on your wings lest you dash your foot against a stone. What a temptation. In other words, he was telling Jesus, show, let the world know, hang in the air, and everybody will know that you are the son of God. And look at how the devil is using pride to deceive people. Pride. And if there's anything that God hates, it's pride. I was telling the first service, a truth issue I'm realizing of late is that people that God is promoting all across the world and especially in the kingdom of God. Ministries that God is elevating that are genuine understand that the devil also promotes his own but they don't last. But through ministries that God is promoting people that God is making rich for the end time harvest I took, you know, I was in Tobago and it was as if God had literally taken young men that he has blessed immensely and brought them to that wedding. Young people! And one mark that was common amongst all of them were their humility. And these were young people who command millions. Millions. But the humility. You see, humility is not a gift. God says you humble yourself and I will lift you up. It is not something that you, it's, it's, it's something that by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, you must make a conscious effort to make. And God is able to make you do that in the name of Jesus. You humble yourself by becoming obedient to God's word. If God says respect, respect. If God says love your wife, love your wife. If God tells you as a child of God, I don't like this, stop it, stop it. And let me say this again. Anybody in life, no matter who you are, no matter your status, if you do not have somebody in your life who can stand at your face and tell you stop it, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. If nobody can tell you stop it. Eh? Huh? As for me, nobody, nobody advises me. Eh? You are in trouble. That is pride to the second square. The mathematicians explain that. How do you say that? Mm. <laughs> he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself, throw yourself down. And they will, you see, all what he was trying to do was to let Jesus minister in pride. But Jesus said to him, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. Then the last temptation, he takes him to the highest mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the earth, and says, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give them to you because they, it has been delivered unto me. In the garden, Adam delivered that authority to him. So he knows that he is the God of this age. And he's saying that if only you will bow your knees and worship me, I will give all these riches unto you. Listen. Never bow your knee to the devil to become rich in the name of Jesus. So today you see greed everywhere. A footballer going to play his football. It is his talent. It is his strength. It is his money. Just give it to him. It's as simple as that. He is the one running around the pitch for 90 minutes. Give him his money. 
I hope Nigeria have solved the problem. Because they have also refused to train. Simply because they know that after the march, that is the end of their money. Greed, power, money, power. The last of their eyes. Anything. And the devil says, look, 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 I will give all of them to you. And today people will do all kinds of things for money. People will literally walk in the marketplace, strip naked for three days for them to become rich. People will sleep in coffins for days just to become rich. Bowing to the devil. Making the music ministry do all kinds of things just for wealth. But I see a generation that fears God. I see the Daniel generation. I see the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego generation that will not bow their knees to the devil or to man in the name of Jesus. Now today in some countries, a, a young girl who has completed university, you don't sleep with the man, you won't get a job. But the Lord will bring you the right job in the name of Jesus. Huh. Greed. And that if there is anything the devil loves from you and me and seeks from you and me, it is worship. But thou shalt worship the Lord alone and him alone shall thou worship in the name of Jesus. The truth about our God is that he is a merciful and compassionate God. Therefore, he allowed Jesus to be tempted in all these areas and he overthrew the devil. So you are victorious over every temptation that will come your way in the name of Jesus. Understand? Let me end by saying, I'll continue the message another time. The truth about our walk with God is that if you live a life of praying and fasting, not only does power become available unto you, the truth is that the challenges of our generation are so real. And at times, all what you have to go do is to become real to God and say that, Lord, I have no power over this issue. Therefore, I'm humbling myself before you in prayer. At times it can be a weakness. But at times also, you just want to draw closer to God. There are various reasons for fasting. And at times, you want to fast because you want to live a disciplined, Christian, spirit-fed life. Because at times, as you walk through the, the streets, the magazines that are displayed alone is enough to, let, to make you understand, keep your eyes straight. And as all those things pump through your head, you need to make a quality decision that you will live a life of praying and fasting. I pray Trinity Baptist Church. May the heavens be opened over us in the name of Jesus. Amen. When we fast, may we receive power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Power to break every altar that have been erected against us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Altars are so important that God had to send a man of God to Judah. To go and speak to the altar in the temple because it had been turned into idolatry worship. And all what the man of God had to do was to go speak to the altar. And as he spoke to that altar, the, the altar split and burnt and it became ashes. Any altar erected against you is burning right now in the name of Jesus. I didn't hear you. I said it is being destroyed by the finger of God in the name of Jesus. By the blood of the everlasting covenant, it is being canceled in the name of Jesus. Let's bow down our head. Precious Father, this afternoon I honor you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the grace and the strength that you have given to us as your people. To be able to come before you in praying and fasting. Father, I pray that as much as fasting becomes difficult for many, because for many it is when they start fasting that they begin to feel all kinds of headaches and all kinds of attacks. But I pray that my Lord and my God that your grace will become abundant. 
over us as a church and as a family. And that you grant us the grace to begin to fast corporately as a church. And Father, as in obedience, we start coming here this Friday. I pray that there shall be tangible testimonies in the name of Jesus. That there shall be tangible miracles in the name of Jesus. That there shall be tangible breakthroughs in the name of Jesus. That we shall see the power and the hand of God breaking forth mightily in our midst for the excellency of your honor and glory in the name of Jesus. And the people of God shall say, Glory 